Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. For you already, and we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Peter Boatwright, Professor of Marketing at the Tepper School, to talk to you about on one of the areas of great collaboration that go on on this campus, and also about one of his passions. Uh, so I'm, uh, we've, when their new book came out, uh, we did a great book tour around the United States and uh, had great responses from our alumni. I'm very intrigued by the concepts that were developed here. Uh, but I want to leave that to Dr. Peter Wilwright to share with you. So join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Wilwright. Well, I wish we had enough time and a forum for each of you to share your stories, because I think what one of the impressive things about Tepper uh, are you all, uh, the, the people who come here. And it's, uh, I think that's one of the joys of being a faculty member here, is interacting with uh, some of the world's greatest people in terms of energy, and, but not just intellect. I mean, this culture here, as you know, is one where you contribute uh, towards the school in terms of time, of uh, programs, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to be involved with. So thank you for your ongoing role, because clearly since you're here, you're, you're adopting an ongoing role and not just disappearing off into, into elsewhere. So today I'm going to talk about a subject of, of a fairly recent book. I guess it's getting less and less recent over time. Uh, but just as a context, I, I work in the area of innovation, uh, it, which is really a whole lot of fun. I can't really imagine a, a more enjoyable topic to be studying and working with. Especially when I think my piece of it is especially enjoyable because many people who are studying innovation are looking like at a history of an industry and they're going back and saying, ah, oh, what did they do well? So we can learn from that and then kind of replicate and take the best practices of what they've done. That's not what I'm doing. I think that's interesting. I think mine's even more fun. Another thing that, uh, another area of innovation that people do is more of an economist framework where they assume an invisible hand. People are going to figure it out, but let's foster that environment. Let's set up the industry structure to foster innovation. Let's provide the incentives uh, and working environment, collaboration, all these things to hope that innovation happens. Uh, that's important. We want to set up innovation and, and encourage it. But the world I'm doing, I'm trying to teach people to be that invisible hand. I'm trying to teach people to do that, the how-to, uh, the work of innovation, which I think, I mean, you're right, right there on the front line. You're very much involved in making it happen, which I think is uh, the most fun part of this. Another enjoyable area, another enjoyable reason about working innovation is that it applies to every company and every industry. And these are some companies that I've had some experience in, in coming alongside and working. And um, they learn a little bit from me, and I learn a lot from them, too. And then once you learn from one company, maybe a software company, you go to a, a pharmaceutical company and you can share something with them that adds to their process and, and so forth. So you see a whole variety of indus industries. Bayer uh, worked with materials, P&G is uh, consumers. You've got pharmaceuticals with Glaxo, uh, Apple technology. So just, wow, uh, that's also entertaining to keep learning instead of to stop learning. And so th those are a couple of books that, that I've had the, you know, I learned while writing them. It's not like you just, well, some of us, I guess, continue to learn while we're writing. Others might already know lots and put it all down. Uh, but uh, uh, some, for me at least, as I'm putting it all down, I'm learning as I go or doing the research to figure out what to write. So these are just my little introduction to the area. Now, innovation it's all about an opportunity to an extent. So it's exciting in that. You have the sense of, how can I go change people's lives? And that's the part that it's enthralling and brings people in. But there's also the, ugh, the danger part, the risk part. And as you start to look at the risks in any industry, they're, they're pretty high. So here's one statistic. Most products fail, with 80% of products fail. And I actually, in posting this, I picked a conservative one because most of the studies actually peg it higher. 90% of products fail, 95% of products fail. And then it gets even more depressing as you delve into this more uh, because you start to realize that these aren't the worst ideas that are failing. In many cases, these are the best ideas that are failing, which, which really sounds confusing. But take a quick look at sort of the steps through any kind of new development process. At some point, the industry comes across or a company comes across a bunch of ideas. Maybe uh, these are through a contest where they're looking outside and getting ideas coming in. Or maybe these are already ideas in-house. So that's my little light bulb starting off. You've got a bunch of ideas, but you don't really move forward with very many of them. 
up front, you can tell certain ones of these aren't going to fit your capabilities. So they don't look like they have as large of a market as some others. So you're going to begin to narrow your resources down. So uh, as far as moving forward, the firm encounters a bunch of ideas. They're only going to begin to seriously review a very few of those. And then of those that are they review, they're going to start to throw away some. They realize, oops, this doesn't look like it has legs. And so they're going to seriously start to analyze even more, fewer. And then of those ones they analyze, they're going to develop fewer of those. And the ones they develop, uh, they're actually going to launch even fewer. And so you're getting the best of the best of the best of the best of the best. And the ones that they commercialize, all these studies of failure are really focused on commercialized products, those in the public domain. And so 80%, 90% of the best of ideas are failing. And so that's, whew, that's really uh, uh, sobering as a fact. So uh, what do we do about this? Well, that's in some ways an introduction to, to the area of our book. Because all of us have, have skills. You're working in companies that know how to develop technologies or products that are actually better than competition. But that's not good enough, is it? Because the question is, well, how do we do more than just have a higher performance level or higher quality level? How in the world do we actually succeed in captivating the marketplace? So the answer that we came to on this is actually the answer to an even more simple question. Is, uh, you know, let's step back and say, why do people use products in the first place? And there's, there's lots of reasons, right? I mean, there's, uh, that your product saves you time. Your product cleans up really easily. It, uh, it's convenient, and, and all these reasons boil down to you know, what products do for you, which is kind of, it's kind of obvious. We, that was the whole point of the product development process in the first place, to figure out what you could do. Uh, but there's yet another reason why people use products as well, another fundamental reason that's how products make you feel. And this is, this is one that companies are less familiar with in building products. It's less, it's less part of their product development process. And yet, products that captivate us are not just the ones that do the right things for us, but the ones that make us feel the right ways. So let, I'm going to explore the feeling side of things, because I'm working with many companies. It's less part of their routine. And, uh, and so I want to walk through that with some examples and, and some takeaways with you. So think about music industry. It's worth tens of billions of dollars. But and this is even after Napster started to uh, erode a chunk of the money away to piracy. Uh, doing and feeling. Music is an extreme. It's like all feeling. It doesn't do anything for you other than create emotions and feelings in you. It does that quite well. And you can create a whole range of feelings in you, depending on the type of music. Uh, so, but most products and services are actually a mixture of the two. So I'm going to move on to a retailer, Nordstrom. Nordstrom, it's nice to pick because they're near the top of customer satisfaction charts year after year after year. So what are they doing well? Uh, well, one thing, let's think about the doing side. What does Nordstrom do? Well, they scour the whole world over and, and select high fashion exclusive products. And they make those available to you to, to look at, to try on, and, and to purchase if you like. But how about the feeling side? Is there a feeling side of Nordstrom? I mean, I've gone to Nordstrom and been in there and shopped. and. I have to say, they make me feel pretty good. I mean, they I feel really important. And, uh, you know, they call me Mr. Boatwright, Mr. Boatwright. And then I, you know, walk out and I'm like, I want that again. You know, I go back and uh, so here's loyalty in part being affected by, by emotion, by the feeling of, of being there. So um, there's a doing and a feeling mixture in Nordstrom. How about uh, that's a Harley at the far right of the screen? Now, it's a motorcycle, so you could say it's transportation. That's what it does. But I don't know. How many of you own Harleys? Right, some. <laughs> how many of you know people who own Harleys? Some. You've got to ask yourselves, was it purchased? Did you purchase it for transportation? No. No. All right. There's some other reason. The feelings of escape from the constraints of society, escape from everyday work week, or, or many other reasons. So... I want to delve into this in a little more depth. And I'll just have one more example. Uh, so this is, I'm going to work with trucking industry. And this is, these are these long haul trucks that uh, you can't really get an order from Amazon without having a long haul truck bring it to your town to get to your door. Uh, and so this is pretty integral to the business in the United States. And this particular company, uh, Navistar International, is, is one that's been around quite a long time. In fact, in one of their early uh, intellectual property litigation cases, the opposing attorney was Abraham Lincoln. 
All right, so they, they've been around, and, and the, uh, the, the current president of the trucking company, which is actually a Tepper alum, what, what year is D. Kapoor? Do you... 1976. 1976. So D. Kapoor in <coughs> 76 is leading up, and he likes to tell you that not only did they uh, go against Abraham Lincoln, but they won that case. They beat Lincoln. <laughs> All right. But uh, uh, at the end of the last century, uh, Navistar was falling on hard times. They had had this strategy of trying to be low-cost provider, and eventually margins were so thin that it really wasn't the place they wanted to be. So what they did is often is they're changing direction, they changed management, and that's when they brought in a Tepper alum, all right, to turn things around. So he's, uh, he's still at the helm, and he has turned things around, uh, changed new direction. And, and uh, if you think about trucking, they're, they're very much a business tool. This is about moving product uh, with the lowest cost of, of possible. And so, I mean, the, these business tools have been refined year after year. So, you know, like these engines, these coming engine, coming engines last for a million miles plus. But even the interior, it's all about being a business tool, historically. And so, you know, you've got the seat that, you know, has the driver be there for those million miles. There's just enough of a bed to get back on the road, you know, catch those sleep and get back on the road. So you can, because you're not moving, you're not making money unless you're moving down the road. So all of this has been about work, work, work. And one of the things Dee recognized when he came is, Oh, I think there's more here than the business tool, the emotion side of things. When you think about the emotions of drivers, one thing are fleets. Fleets have tons of drivers, and it's a, it's a pretty dismal lifestyle. And so turnover is really high. It's greater than 100% employee turnover every year. So you're having to retrain your whole workforce, which gets expensive. Or think about owner-operators. Owner-operators own one or a few trucks. They're small businessmen. But in society, we think of entrepreneurs, small businessmen, separately and differently from truck drivers. And so they don't have the sense of professional respect that they hunger for in our society. So there seems to be, can we, can we begin with our vehicle to reach some of these deep felt needs that are, on, that are intangible needs? And so Dee, uh, through the years, uh, helped develop this particular truck, the Lone Star. This was launched in 2008. Uh, it is a business tool as well as looking cool. All right, it, it is a head turning truck. But it's, for instance, uh, it is, when it came out, it was the most aerodynamic truck on the planet. And that was from all directions, because they were the first company to put their trucks in a wind tunnel and to run the wind from all directions. And wind blows from all directions, so it's, it's important for fuel efficiency. Look at the interior. This interior is more like the cabin of a private jet than it is of a typical truck. That uh, bed in the back uh, is a Murphy bed that folds down, influenced in part by, where's Sue Joy? Where'd you go, Sue Joy? All right, Stu Joy worked on a, a similar bed when he was here uh, as part of an IPD project, a, a project class that we had here. All right, so then they continue to develop and, and iterate. There's a, inside there's a kitchenette behind one of those panels for truckers to prepare more healthier food uh, than what they can pick up at the truck stop. And notice there's even like this hardwood floor that you might find in your living room. All right, so this is, this is a pretty nice space. This really resonated tremendously with the marketplace. I mean, dealers, I mean, this was 2008. Timing couldn't have worked out worse for, for International in terms of the economy. But dealers were really quite pleased in that they increased foot traffic despite the economy. Or here's another, another thing that, was, that caught their attention. They, when they unveiled this truck at a truck show, they had the foresight to, to bring a tattoo artist. And they had truckers lined up to get tattoos of the grill or the logo. Now, you've heard of people getting tattoos of certain brands that they, they love, like Harley. Do you have a Harley tattoo even? No, no Harley tattoo. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you've heard of this, but here's a truck that nobody even owned yet. Nobody had driven. And they may not have even touched it yet. So you can see that they really hit a chord and resonated with their truckers in, in bringing this out. Um, so I've got some lessons here, some takeaways, because you're in a classroom. All right, uh, and you know Tepper, we like to make sure that you learn things. So I've got five takeaways for you. Uh, the first is that the captivating products are ones that aren't just delivering the performance side, but it's the products themselves that are also delivering and hitting home on these intangible benefits, the, the feelings that people seek out. Now, there are, you know, people's emotions in products are pretty well known, but there's a couple of paths to, to develop those. One of the paths is what I'm really working with today, which is using your products and your services and your people to engender those emotions directly every time somebody's using that product or service that they're beginning to feel those things that you're desiring them to feel. There's another path that's a little bit more well-known, more calm, and actually less efficient money-wise, and it's to create associations. Here, think advertising. 
if you're told over and over and again that something is youthful, eventually we associate youthfulness with that product and we begin to feel those feelings. All right? But it's pretty costly to achieve those associations and, and to create them. So uh, just for efficiency's sake, uh, I would suggest that it's a lot cheaper if you can directly and authentically create the emotions and do, those, do so with your products. All right? And then the products themselves begin to emanate and, and you can create the word of mouth. So this is the part I'm focusing on, even though there's two paths to creating emotion. I just wanted you to separate these two and, and put this with your products and services directly. So one more example along these lines, and, and this is just perfect for Alumni Weekend because this company is led by yet another uh, Tepper alum. Red Zone Robotics is Eric Close, and he's a 97? All right, 97 grad. So he, uh, this was his second company, if I remember the story correctly, to buy out of bankruptcy. Uh, and uh, he, this company had previously, uh, as a spinoff of CMU, had previously had this sort of a one-off project mentality. They would build, somebody have a need for a robot to go explore a volcano and gather scientific data, and so Red Zone would build a robot to go there. Right? But it's really expensive to build robot individually and uniquely for each individual client. So Eric, when he came in, he decided, how can I, how can I develop what area can I target and develop a business for where I can use robots over and over again? And so he identified the sewer industry. All right, so he decided that uh, these sewers, uh, you know, there's tons of miles of these, they're getting old. Uh, this particular image is, is meant to evoke the deep sewer systems that are 150 feet down, six to eight foot diameter pipes. There's one down at the bottom of the hill. Let me feel, get directions here. That way. All right, so down at the bottom of the hill, toward before you get to the bridge, Apparently one of these, I don't know if it's 150 feet down from what point on that, I'm not sure. But somewhere down there, there's one of these deep sewer systems. Over time, though, these begin to fill with debris. Over time, they, they crack. And you can begin to think about the environmental hazard if you start to have this massive pipe that's beginning to leak. Uh, and it's so deep, what do you do? It's expensive. And so Eric had the idea, hey, we'll take our robots, we'll send them down in there, and we'll, we'll fix them up, clean them up. And it was enough to, to have the business going. And, and he was doing well, but he was hitting, apparently, this, this spot where he wasn't growing as rapidly as he wanted. And he started to think, well, what is, what is here my business model? What is the value proposition? And so in th rethinking about it, he realized it was not so much the physical side of the business, which is the value proposition, but the intangible, the emotion side. So here, think about it for a minute. Every city has some kind of a city manager who's responsible <coughs> for the infrastructure of the city. However, as they dole out their budget, think about what they're going to fix. They're going to fix the things that are broken, the, fix that they, the things that they know are problems. And here, in terms of the sewer systems hidden away, you're kind of worried. They might be breaking, they might be filling, they might be leaking, but you'd never really necessarily know. And so the problem for the city manager is not that they have a broken system. The problem is their worry, their anxiety. Uh-oh, what if this, I've heard about other things happening in other cities, what if it happens to me? And so Eric began to realize, oh, I can leave you. I can deliver emotions. I can use information to document the state of the system, where problems will occur, when the problems will occur. And that's the business model that he began to realize. He began to realize that what the city managers want is confidence. Confidence their systems are intact. They want to feel validated. They're spending their money wisely and when, not, not to repair a whole sewer pipe, but just that piece needs to be targeted. They want to be thought leaders and using latest technology, but not excessively. They want to be taken care of, or a vendor, and they want to be connected with their system. So these were things, these were, began to be the focus of his strategy. And this, began, this was when his company began to grow and went from seven to 70 employees, when they realized that it can be an information service and not just a repair service. Now I hope you're starting to recognize that these intangibles, I mean, you can start to think of them as fluffy and unnecessary, because they are intangible after, after all. And yet, when you start to think about what these, these feelings are, confidence in your job, professional respect, human dignity for the truckers. These are deeply important to people. And so if we're delivering emotion, hope, encouragement, there's a company I worked with on their smoking cessation. I mean, think about hope that I'll actually uh, get rid of that addiction or remove myself from smoking. Uh, it takes a lot of encouragement, a lot of feelings along the way during some very, very difficult times. So. These, these things are hopefully, you start to see these are deeply important and meaningful. And when you begin to reach people at that deep level, that's when they respond at that level. 
I mean, all the companies are wanting people to respond and say, hey, look at what I've got, and tell their friends. And, and we talk about what we're excited about. We talk about what we're emotional about. And so as we're looking to stimulate word of mouth in the, in the uh, uh, marketplace, if you reach people at an emotional level, they're going to respond and give you that uh, reaction that your company's seeking out. So here's two more takeaways. Here's the second one. In captivating products, it's the products themselves that are delivering the emotions, right? You're not creating these after the fact. And thirdly, if you're uh, wanting customers to respond at this emotional level, and I think every company does, all right, then reach them at the emotional level. I mean, another analogy here is my family and I are taking Spanish right now. It's great to take classes with your kids. And so, uh, you know, if you want, you know, the Spanish teacher, she greets us at the door, hola, you know, because she's wanting us to respond in Spanish. So if you want somebody to respond in Spanish, speak to them in Spanish. If you want to reach, if you, people want, if you want people to respond emotionally, speak to them at that level and they'll respond in kind. All right, well, how do we do this? Process. Well, this is a very high-level overview of a process, simplified, three steps. It's the same steps you'd have with any product development. What, identify what people are wanting, figure out your strategy for delivering it, and then actually do it, achieve it, create products, features, etc. Let's look at this in a medical context, just to keep adding to our examples. I mean, the medical field, it's, it's replete with, product, with products which are overly medical feeling. And anytime we have a product that feels medical, there's already some room for improvement. Because nobody wants to feel sick. They want to feel healthy. Nobody wants to feel anxiety. Uh-oh, what about my future? They're wanting to feel the confidence. And so there's an opportunity to make every medical product feel less medical. So let's look at one quick example. Here's a CPAP machine. This is for sleep apnea, for, for people so they can get better rest and also has some long-term health implications. Now, I don't know the age of this machine. It's kind of old looking, very, very medical looking is why I put it on the screen. This is supposed to be in a bedroom. So every time you'd walk in your bedroom, you'd see this very medical looking device. Well, one company, here's a uh, company named ResMed, realized, whoo, we can make this look high tech. Now, certainly it's not just skin deep here because they had to redo some of the technology inside to shrink this form factor down and to change the shape, all right? So, there's some technological you know, achievement here to get this down, but, um, but the appearance itself can have potential. While we're talking skin deep, let's, re let's really go skin deep. All right, let's go skins. So uh, what if you're a, you know, kind of a manly man and you're wanting the Harley edition of your CPAP machine? You can get that. <laughs> you can get that in every case you ever have this, uh, this issue. All right. Or maybe you start to think, well, why am I? on this machine. This, this is uncomfortable. Why am I doing this? It's for my family. So you might have a picture of your family wrapped around. Right? So already, just with pretty uh, inexpensive ways, very skin deep, you can start to ad potentially address emotion. Well, how about, how about going deeper? All right? Hearing aids. Now, a lot of the technology development in hearing aids has been, in essence, aesthetic. It's trying to make it disappear. You don't want to look medical, so let's, let's make it go away. But think of the impact that Bluetooth has had on hearing aids. Now it's, now it's your phone. So now it's so you can talk with your friends, talk with your family. Now it's your stereo system in your head. And you're walking around, you can listen to music. And so the fundamental purpose of your device shifts from just overcoming a problem to these desirable aspects of life that you don't want to miss out on. And so, again, shifting the whole motion space with it. It's the same process that International used. I mean, they recognized up front, as I said, the need for self-respect, human dignity, pride, and began to find ways to achieve this. Now, often people ask, what about services? All right, you've given me all sorts of uh, visuals of physical products. Uh, so let me, do, let me do a service example, and I'm going to use Ritz-Carlton here. Ritz-Carlton is certainly a, an award-winning hotel started by uh, uh, Cesar Ritz. Uh, he started numerous of these hotels. Uh, but the reason I'm choosing it is, is that they've moved progressively to a pure service model. They've, gotten, they've realized their best growth strategy is not to continue building hotels, but to be a management company of other people's hotels. And so they are purely a service, and they win awards. They're not only just winning hotel awards, they've won the Ball Rouge Award more than once. In term, so they're winning awards across. So let's look at it. What are they doing in the service arena? Well, first of all, let me, let me talk about the internal and, aspect, internal and external products. This is my words. So you could use various words for this. You think about a service, the external product is what the service accomplishes for the ultimate client. So uh, a, a consultant 
often would be providing some uh, technology for the client or a design for a client or a professor providing the students with some uh, a, you know, material that they're learning. An attorney is providing, uh, they're filling out some forms, not just filling out forms, but they're uh, structuring a legal agreement and providing that contract. All right, so that's I'm thinking of as the external product. The internal product of a service are its people. So you think about if you hire the right consultants, you don't really have to work so much to think about the external product because your consultants will take care of that because they're, they're enabled. If you, have, if you have the right attorneys in your partnership, you're not really having to watch. What are you doing? What are you doing? Are you? They take care of that. So I want to focus here on the internal, the people, and how do we have our system to design the people and build an emotion. So let's look and see what does uh, Ritz Carlton do. One thing is certainly design up front. To a great extent, this is hiring the right people. Right? And in every company has their process of very carefully vetting who they're hiring. Uh, and then there's training. There's upfront training and there's ongoing training. Uh, but I want you to see that there's an opportunity to define emotions into the role of each of your personnel. So here's a quote from, uh, from Horst Schultz, the founding president and COO of, of, uh, of the company. And I'm going to read this. Uh, to you in case it's not legible uh, from where you're sitting. So he was here, he's talking about the bartender at a hotel, and he's saying, in case of the bar, customers are entering your room, but they're not coming for you. They're not coming to drink. They've got drinks in their rooms and at home. They're not coming to eat. They're coming to feel well. It is, your ultimate responsibility is that each guest feels well when they leave because of how you enhance their life in the moment that you had to serve them. Now certainly, if the bartender didn't know how to make the right drink or messed it up or whatever, there's a problem. And so that wasn't what, the, what Horst Schultz is emphasizing. He's emphasizing that that's not enough. To be successful, and they are successful at Ritz-Carlton, to be successful, you've got to have the feeling lay it in there important as well. So design up front, teaching people what these are is important. But there's also a strange thing about the people, people design, that it's ongoing, maybe even daily. So if you put a hardwood floor in a truck, it's still a hardwood floor later. But if you teach somebody, the bartender, about the importance of making somebody feel well, they, people change over time. You have to remind them. So let's look at another quote. So this is from the corporate VP of HR. Our employees are on the front lines. They're always on the battlefield. So you've got to nourish them on a daily basis. You have to heal the wounds of being on the battlefield daily. Otherwise, they'll forget the real reasons that they are there. And he goes on and talks about a, a, a cleaning lady, a maid that she said, you know, after she cleans 16 rooms in a day, she thinks her job is cleaning rooms. It's not. It's serving people. Right? So there's this ongoing. So in designing of your internal product, your people, there's upfront and training. But there's also this ongoing reminding, reminding, keeping them focused on what you feel are really the, the issues at hand. Third thing is at the back end. It's like you've got to give people actually how do you implement this. So if we're going to have professional respect in a truck, there are features of the truck, like the hardwood floor, that makes it feel very professional. But if we're thinking about actions of employees, you've got to instruct them of certain actions that they can do to achieve the objectives that you want them to achieve. So for instance, one of the or training rules at, at Ritz-Carlton is that if, an, if, uh, if a guest walks up, and you're an employee, and a guest walks up and asks you for directions, you drop whatever you're doing, and you don't give them directions. You walk with them. So instead of saying, oh, yeah, the ATM's down the hall, take left, left, and go to the right, no. Stop. You walk with them to that ATM machine. And so now they're feeling that they are important as you think they are. And so you've trained people to have certain actions. So if you give them a lot of actions, then they, they can do those at least, and then your employees can build on those actions and begin to develop more to cultivate that culture. All right, so this is an example in a service. So your takeaway four, we only have five of these. All right, so takeaway four is that captivating products can be created through a formal process. The reason I'm saying this is I don't want to just inspire you while you're here to say, all right, you can do this. I want to show you how. And so I think that every single one of you, this is not a, you know, a difficult conceptually process. I think every single one of you can think about for your companies, what are some things that I can begin to do today? And you can begin to think about how to implement them. So how? All right, but is it worthwhile? All right, certainly you can change lives, but at some point you've got to stay in business. You've got to have an ongoing stream of revenues so that you can continue to provide those services and products to, to the world. So, uh, but it, everything costs. 
So if you're going to invest in some kind of emotion, maybe it's cheaper, maybe expensive, but it costs. So is it profitable? Now, we did some various studies, and, and in the book we had some profit, uh, profits of a feature. Here's, here's this kind of a very high-level flyover of profitability where we queried various uh, 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 people on <coughs> industries to say which, which one of these companies in particular are more emotional than their competitors, uh, more emotional benefits. And so, in essence, what we did is we took all the statistically significant companies that were providing higher levels of emotion, valued emotions than competitors, and we put those together in a group like you would an index. So now, we, now all I have to do is track. These were all publicly traded. Now we can just track the performance of these companies and see how well they do. All right. Well, they did really well. So here's 10-year return. Uh, the red line is this emotion-based index, and those blue lines are your major indices, your Dow Jones, et cetera. Now, this was in 2007, and it was looking backwards in time. And we did three-year, five-year. We did random holdout periods. It, it, it won a little bit scarily too well, uh, which was actually our purpose wasn't to develop a winning stock, all right? That wasn't our goal, all right? Our goal was, well, gosh, this is, should be pretty sim simple. If we believe that people value certain emotions, and if they're willing to pay for what they value, that second one's pretty easy to agree with, they're willing to pay for that they value, then we should see this. We just didn't know how much the margin would be. But that's what we were just checking. We're not checking, we're just saying, do, if this isn't true, we've got a problem with our theory. And so we're just looking and say, is it true? But it was awfully hard not to be curious about the future. All right, so, you know, what happens going forward from 2007? Or when you start to think of, again, 2008 was really not a good time in this country and in the world economically, how do these fare through a severe economic downturn? Well, here's four years after the study. So going through May of 11. The red line again is the high motion index. It plunged at the same time the whole market went out. But look what rose out of the trough most rapidly first and still ahead. Uh, it's almost time for me to do the fi five years ahead. So um, this summer I'll, I'll go actually redo the plot. So we're almost there. Um, so it's, it's done pretty well. So at a very high level, these firms that are providing the emotions people value are, are paying off uh, and doing quite well. So takeaway five, it's worth doing. You can find ways to make it worth doing. All right? Certainly, you can always spend more money than you have, and that's not what I'm, but you can find ways to make this worthwhile. So that's where I'm going to leave you and open up for Q&A. Um, but when I want to leave you, the sort of the major takeaways that I want you to think about are that people do value these deeply these emotions like hope, all right, like human dignity, and you can really serve your customers in ways that they value and reward you for doing that. So if that's not currently part of the strategy of your company or your area, uh, think about how can you do that because it's a win-win. You're improving their lives, and, and you're going to be able to continue to do so if you can make a business of it. All right, with that, let me open for, for any kinds of questions that you have. Yes? Yes. So we're, that's just pure stock, uh, stock price of that uh, set of companies. Oh, we did a survey, uh, a customer survey of, well, not a customer survey, an MBA survey, actually, of incoming MBA students of a whole bunch of stocks. Which ones, and I've forgotten the exact wording, but uh, it's basically which ones are providing higher levels of emotional value than their competitors. So it was by industry. And so we took the ones that were statistically significant. We actually did the, the bottom side, the ones that were lower in emotions as well. And uh, I didn't, I just not declutter things, but they, the red line's always above uh, the, the low emotion index as well. Okay. Yes? Uh, one question, for example, for a small company which aspires to become a high emotional with its customers. Is it possible to apply this, this index? Can be calculated for small companies? Well, I, I think for a small company, I wouldn't be so focused on the index. I'd be focused on what can you provide for your customers. Uh, and um, some of this is, some of this can be really cheap in the sense that there's evidence like there's like putting the right color dye in your plastic so it's not just the same bland color everybody else has that can have an effect. I mean, I'm giving sort of the cheapest possible example. But think about for your, your clients or your customers, what are they looking for in an emotion side? And you start to strategize ways that you can achieve that within your budget. 
but at some point you would like to see the effect of this. Yeah. Uh, I asked you this because in okay. my business I try to, to know where I am versus highly emotional, yeah. uh, hi highly emotional brands, let's say. So what I suggest on, on, okay, so now is it paying off? Is it worthwhile? Uh, what I would suggest doing there is, is measuring, I imagine you have some kind of competitor's products or you have before and after, you have different models. I would still do, these are, this is actually pretty challenging to do, but uh, you, it's achievable to do some kind of survey where they're comparing products relatively, which ones uh, are, I'm not sure what emotions you're seeking, which ones make me feel more powerful, okay? And if you're looking at product after product, some, some we actually did this with foods, and I was a little nervous. I mean, we had salsas that were, we didn't show people the brand name, for instance. I mean, come on, are we going to get different emotions than people saying one salsa has higher levels of emotion than another? But we did. I, w I was actually surprised. So it's that kind of, of survey or test, product test, that I would suggest that you could start to see the evidence. Are you, are you heading in the right direction? Yes? I'm an elected official in a nearby state, and I just wonder if you've ever taken any of these and applied it to governmental perceptions. Well, it's, it's certainly easy to see the negative side. Yes, uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but other than casually observing that, I have not formally investigated it, no. Yes, It question. seems like your, um, this uh, idea of the strategy of emotion is more geared towards uh, niche products like you know, Nordstrom and uh, Harley Davidson and so on. How, mm -hmm. how much effect do you think applies to like, commodity-like products like cement and and things like that. You know. Well, I, uh, I'd Walmart. say the commodities, the reason, maybe the reason they're commodities is they haven't adopted this strategy, and so they're not differentiated. Okay, so if we think about, let's just move to pure branding for a moment, because branding is, it's either information or it's emotion. That's really what it is. And so brands can take commodities and start to separate them somewhat. Uh, if you take, I mean, an easy example is food, Giant Eagle brand. Uh, the, if you have people do taste tests and observe salsas before they know it's Giant Eagle and after they know it's Giant Eagle, their perceptions shift by itself. All right, so that's an example. Sadly, it's in the negative direction. Uh, uh, Giant Eagle brands are viewed less than if they didn't have the brand at all, and which is a reason for doing store brands that aren't your store names, and that's the whole grocery industry is heading that way. So, so I would suggest that for commodities, uh, certainly you'd want to do perform. You want to do as much to differentiate as you can, not only with emotion, but the emotion is one piece of this that you can differentiate on. Perhaps Starbucks is an example for that. It, Coffee. Commodity. It could be very well uh, an example for that. Now they happen to have higher. There are many high quality coffee shops. I'll put it that way. All right. Yes. Um, is it any follow-ups to um, study about so once you get the, the product to the level that works perfectly and develops the emotions, how do you increase prices? So the idea is, <laughs> what's the right pricing model, or or the or, or for example, if you have an an, an example for the Lone Star product, the margins you mentioned that they were very low, and then that product, I infer that the margins were much higher. So how do these guys price accordingly? Well, I mean, if we think about people, we think about pricing to willingness to pay, which is really the equations we should be using if you could measure and had all the information. Of uh, people, many people do value these emotions and they're willing to pay something for it. Now, measuring the exact amount is not, there's a lot of uncertainty on the measurement of how much people are willing to pay for these. So that, that I agree, agree with, but the direction uh, and some kinds of trial and error. And same kinds of pricing tricks we could do elsewhere of trial and error and uh, adjusting and seeing how the re promotion responsiveness and so forth all apply here uh, as well. But value, they pay for value. Yes? The yes, uh, question is, uh, sometimes the same product triggers different emotions from different markets, different cultures. Mm. So is there uh, any study there? For example, an iPhone. It could be just a a good product here, which has its emotions attached to it, <coughs> but in China or some other market, it could be used as like a symbol of status. Yeah. And people like to show up, something like that. Yeah. So this is just like a, you know, any 
Yeah, we have an example in our book that we did a, we did a case study on a, um, a rice, automatic rice maker that in China. But it was, the company had tried having it uh, be a crock pot as well and have all sorts of functions and features, and it was a disaster. It didn't really fit very well with uh, what the culture's view was for their rice makers. And we also had a, uh, a health product. So it, it's actually a former Chinese student who's now there uh, helped us with that case study for exactly that reason is that when you're studying for, for whether it's performance benefits or emotion-based benefits, knowing your, your customers is going to be what drives your innovation. Right. Yes? So if you want to market professional services mm -hmm. to a cynical business community, how do you, what, what are the emotional keys that you're going to use to sort of get people to come back off their cynicism and mm -hmm. take a look at you? They're probably cynical about you and not themselves, just as a quick guess. So make them feel smart. I don't know. Uh, we're a very cynical, you know, we can think of uh, the uh, faculty here as challenging everything. And we're a business community. But you make us feel smart. Mm, I know a lot. No, oh, it's a guess. I have to study, you know, the each, every environment. So you're going to say, ah, you teach on innovation. What's a good idea over here? I don't know. It comes out of, out of your research of what they're wanting, and without doing it, I, I don't know. Right. Uh, we haven't done it to the left side for a while. Yes, my left side. So Charles Rosen, founder of Revlon, said, I'm not selling lipstick, I'm selling hope. Yes. So how does this apply when you're talking about products that aren't really specific, don't have a specific utility? Most of the products that you dealt with have a, have a utilitarian message mm. to them, and you were able to show that. <laughs> to a message that is an emotional message. What happens when you're dealing in the form of cosmetics, fashion, even some food products that really don't have a utilitarian aspect so much and are truly sold even uh, traditionally on an emotional basis? Is there a further application of that in this and that environment? Is it, I don't know. I mean, I would, I would imagine, so, the words we would use here as utilitarian and hedonic, all right, which I'm not sure is the best word for what you're looking at. Looking at, but um, I would imagine that uh, these non-utilitarian or hedonic types of products have more potential, more reaction, more elasticity. We'll say in terms of reaction to uh, uh, the emotion-based elements. What I would say is part of the challenge is how do you, other than advertising, so. Uh, cosmetics are often telling you what you're supposed to feel. What are some actual ways we can begin to do that with the product itself? And certainly there's color choices, there's packaging. Maybe they've done all they can. I haven't, again, studied their industries, but I'd say that I'd see they're, they're living off this as well. Uh, and I'm not sure if they have greater potential now or less. I haven't, not sure. Okay, up top. <coughs> you, uh, product that everyone in this room is familiar with is the Tepper School. Yes. How do you build um, emotion into the Tepper offering, of which certainly the Carnival Weekend is an example, and what school do you think does the best job of building emotion into its product? What school? Uh, well, I think it's the strongest branded business school is still Harvard, by, by any measure. Uh, so I mean, that's just, again, I haven't studied that, but I live in the business school world. So that's, it's something that, that I would guess on uh, with more. How do we build it in? I've started to have some conversations on that, all right? Um, have we any, you guys are here. <laughs> this is the kind of question where the professor says, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah, well, I was actually going to ask you. I mean, I read it in 2002, and after 10 years, like, um, everything just talk to our emotions and feelings. Everything is just nicer, you know, when I come here. For example, this curtains thing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the wood, wood framing. It, it's, I mean, you know, some of that money or mm -hmm. not just our temper giving money, it, it does really change the just the look and feel of how you know, it just feels walking around this facility now than what it was 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, 
with that question and some of the things you showed in the very first slides about not only product but the feelings and emotions that students experience that I think has changed. Right? I think an opportunity for us is for students to feel like they've made it when they come. Mm -hmm. So instead of feeling like, oh, I didn't choose Harvard, they say, oh, I'm so happy to be here. It's a, it's a leading school, a prestigious school, that they feel the, they have the swagger. So I think that's an opportunity for us uh, that we still have to figure out how to get there. Right, yeah. Um. So just going back to one of your slides where you talked about like the, the steps and how the the process. Yes. You mentioned the first step, the process. First part of that process is identifying the emotion. I'm wondering if you can go into a little bit more detail about um, maybe it's relating to the question about cynicism. You know, how do you go through identifying what the right emotions are and how to? Okay. Identify. So part of what I actually left out of this particular uh, slide deck to have more time for Q and A is we actually study. I mean, there are hundreds of, I don't know how many emotions we feel, we have hundreds of words for emotions that, that, that would be in a product and service context, which is too many to research. If you have 131 things to ask about, it's, it's overwhelming. So we, we put these into categories of similar emotions that are related. And so uh, what, we, what we've done with companies and in classes is develop uh, questionnaires and research protocol that are looking specifically for a dozen Actually, I think it's 16 uh, different emotion categories. So up front, the, that's research to understand what do they want to feel. And you can do this in various ways, but that's the, that's the ultimate goal. OK? Is that like a, uh, like a marketing questionnaire? Is it more like an HCI? Or like well, it's not, it's not an easy one to send out on your, in your, uh, over the computer and have people take a survey. Uh, but it's, uh, so it would be, the, I think the easiest way to get the emotions is with having person-to-person kind of interviews, which then means your sample size tends to be small initially. But to at least start to explore it with exploratory research methods gives you a lot of understanding to hone down so then you can do a larger sample, uh, more of analysis where they're going to comparisons later. And this is the time where I say, if you'd like to understand more about Dr. Boatwright's incredible research here, you can get his book. <laughs> uh, built to love creating products that captivate yes. customers. So it's a great. It's got the details and how they how they go through all the methodology on it as well. And if you were doing a good marketing job, you'd have the folks right out there. <laughs> <laughs> we had. Well, I know we have. A, we're going to take a break now. I know you may have some personal questions for them, but our next session begins in 12 minutes. If you're if you're into the marketing and you're going to hear for uh, here for the next presentation, uh, you can stay right in here and relax, or you can use the restroom or come down and ask a personal question. If you're going to be going next door to uh, Dr. John Hooker to hear about international business, uh, you'll be heading there as soon as they're done with uh, their presentation in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbara. Thank you.